one. We'll hear a tutor and two students discussing modern European writers. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. OK, so to continue our look at modern European writers who have focused on the future in their work, today we're talking about H.G. Wells. Last week, I asked you both to do some background research on Wells, which we're going to discuss now. Gitanjali, tell us about H.G. Wells. Right. So... H.G. Wells was a hugely successful British science fiction writer. Writing at the end of the 19th and the start of the 20th century, and much of his work focused on predicting the future. Jason, do you think Wells was just using the future as a narrative device in his fiction? No, no. He really believed we can predict the future. In fact, he gave a speech at the Royal Institution in London in 1902 called The Discovery of the Future. And the point he was making was that by looking at what you know about the present and about science, it's quite possible to predict the future. Indeed. Gitanjali, do you think Wells was always optimistic in his predictions? Not at all. In fact, he varied in his predictions from being extremely pessimistic about the future to being optimistic. Interestingly, one theory I read links the attitude in Wells's work to his own health. When he was writing The Time Machine, which was published in 1895, he'd just been diagnosed with an incurable fatal disease. Not surprisingly, the book is very pessimistic. Being about a dystopia in the future, a long time in the future, the year 802-701 in fact, where there are two races on Earth, the Morlocks and the Eloi, and the Morlocks actually eat the Eloi. I thought it was interesting, though, that it was H.G. Wells who actually came up with the phrase time machine. So despite being pessimistic, the work has had a lasting effect on our culture. Right. After the time machine, though, H.G. Wells didn't die, of course. And his recovery might be why he began to be a bit more optimistic about the future. So that brings us to his first utopia, Anticipations. Jason, tell us about that. Well, Anticipations, or to give it its full title, Anticipations of the Reaction of the Mechanical and Scientific Progress Upon Human Life and Scientific Thought, was published in 1901 and was set in the New Republic of the year 2000. Some of the things Wells predicts are fairly close to our reality today, including 24-hour news, global telecommunications, and even a European Union. We'll come back to the accuracy of Wells's predictions a little later. Gitanjali, how was Wells's work received at the time? Well, although Wells was extremely successful, not everyone respected his work or his predictions. Another well-known science fiction writer, Jules Verne, viciously attacked him for works such as The First Man in the Moon, which Verne argued weren't rooted in scientific fact at all. That's right. Now, Wells wrote a number of other utopian visions of the future. Jason? Yes. In a modern utopia published in 1905, his vision was of a world where there's no private property, where everyone has access to wonderful health care and, interestingly, where everyone's personal information is stored on cards in a central database outside Paris. Apart from the health care, I'm not sure everyone today would see that as a positive view of the future. Neither am I. And, on a similar note, Wells strongly believed in population control and, in the shape of things to come, 
which was published in 1933, he sees and supports a world where the population is kept at 2 billion. Once again, I'm not sure most people today would necessarily see that as a good thing. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Gitanjali, in your research, did you come across anything about the world brain? Yes, I did. It's actually very interesting. Throughout the 1930s, Wells predicted and supported the setting up of a huge world encyclopedia. And towards the end of the decade, in 1938, he wrote a series of essays called World Brain. In these essays, he called for the world to make use of modern technology to create an enormous global encyclopedia so that all our knowledge is available to all people, not just an educated elite. Wells envisioned this as probably being on microfilm. He thought it would allow anyone, anywhere in the world, to look at any book or any document. He also thought it would be created by everyone, once again, not just by an elite. Yes, and as you can imagine, many people today say that the Internet has basically fulfilled his prediction. Of course, it doesn't use microfilm, but essentially, it does meet all Wells's main requirements. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a lecture about dining services. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 11 to 14. Welcome to the Dining Commons. This is the newest facility on campus, and I am proud to say also one of the best. I know that all university students miss eating home-cooked food. Well, this year we are hoping to provide students with food and services that will make you feel at home, even without your family. The administration has been listening to the voice of the students. Students gave us frequent suggestions last year as to how we could improve the university. One of the most frequent suggestions was improving the dining options. We have been working hard all summer to come up with ideas that will make student life in the dormitories more pleasant. One of the new options we are offering in the dining facilities is variety in student meals. Last year, there was a set menu for every dinner, so if students didn't like the food, there was no choice. Students had to eat whatever was served. But this new dining facility has three completely unique areas, each with a different theme. At every meal, there will be three options for students to choose from. For example, 
There might be Italian food at station number one, which might consist of pizza and pasta. At station number two, there would be American food, consisting of hamburgers and hot dogs. At station number three, there could be vegetarian soups and salads, accommodating all the vegetarians. We hope that with the greater selection of food, all students will find something to their liking. Now look at questions fifteen to twenty. Now listen to the tape and answer questions fifteen to twenty. Not only will students have more options, the food will also be better. Each section of the facility will have a head chef. These are real chefs that have been trained in culinary school and have been hired specifically by the school to work in the dining facilities. All of the chefs have a speciality. The school is hoping that these chefs will prepare better-tasting and more nutritious food. Every student will be able to make suggestions, and also give their input as to which menus taste better. Last year, many students complained that the dining facilities didn't have very convenient hours. This year, we hope to change that. We will open for breakfast at 6 a.m. to accommodate all the early risers. In the evenings, we will open until midnight for all the students that like to go for a late-night snack. The afternoons will still remain closed, but we will have a student store open that will provide all students with drinks and fruit. The student store will be open every day. From 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Every student that has paid full tuition and dormitory fees has already paid for their dining facility fees. Students can eat at any time and in any amount for free. If you are a student that does not live in a dormitory, you can still purchase a dining facility card. This card will entitle you to the full services of the dining facility. This card is available only for students and is not open to the general public. If you are not a student and wish to dine here, you must purchase meals at the door. There are a few rules to follow. Even though we do not limit the amount of food that can be taken, we do not want students to waste food. Please do not take more than you can eat. Also. Every student must clean his or her own trays and plates. We will provide plates and trays for student use, but please do not abuse these items. Please do not leave your plates on the tables. Your parents are not here to clean up after you anymore, so I hope all students will be responsible. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the upcoming year. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation about tea between an expert and a reporter. You have thirty seconds to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four.
Hi, Jacob. Thank you so much for coming along today. It's my pleasure. I'm very intrigued about what a tea meditation entails exactly. Well, it's very simple, really. I think the first thing you need to keep in mind is that it is mostly about leaving everything that you have been thinking or worrying about today to one side. Really focus on the present moment. Well, it sounds great. I certainly don't know very much about tea, and I'm keen to get started. But before you go into more detail, can I ask you what your favourite kind of tea is? Well. I think the kind of tea we are going to have today is my favourite. It is pu'er tea from Yunnan Province in southern China. What makes this tea special? Pu'er is a dark tea. The regions of Yunnan, the north of Vietnam and Laos, have one of the best climates for growing tea in the world. Pu'er is a post-fermented tea. Oh, what is a post-fermented tea exactly? It is a tea that has undergone a period of aging in the open air. They age the tea for days, even years. The exposure to humidity and oxygen help to oxidize the tea leaves and encourage fermentation. This changes the smell of the tea and also removes a lot of bitterness from the taste. It sounds similar to the process of aging wine. The process is different, but the effect of aging on the taste is certainly similar. Does this mean the tea can be quite expensive? Absolutely. It can be very expensive. The tea is usually pressed into balls or cakes and sold. At one time, only tea enthusiasts cared about buying these cakes, but now many people have realised that they are an investment, and so buy them like they would buy gold because the price goes up a lot over time. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. So now I want you to focus on clearing your mind of anything other than this present moment. Let go of any concerns. Okay,、uh, one slight problem. I will need to record our conversation, and I will need to take notes for the article.、Uh, I plan to write about this for my newspaper.、Uh, is that okay? Oh yes, of course. Whatever you need. Thank you. I'll try to keep my notes to a minimum. Good. So where was I? Oh yes, I think very few people really appreciate the complexity and variety of tea that exists in the world. Right. Most people are maybe like me and just use tea bags. Exactly. And with a tea bag, the tea is trapped inside and cannot move around freely. You can really taste the difference drinking a brewed tea that was free to move around through all the water. So, do you ever use tea bags? Never. There are many different kinds of tea: white, yellow, black, green, oolong, matcha, herbal, and many others. Each one has its own unique properties. To fully experience what each tea has to offer, you must brew it in the correct way. I also believe in only drinking tea that is picked and sorted by hand, rather than using mechanical processes. Although it takes more time, the tea made by hand is so much better that it leads to an increase in the tea sales. But in that case, surely if there is more interest in the tea, and with the time-intensive farming process, this means there could be shortages because the demand is higher than the ability to produce it. There were shortages for a while, but then an artificial fermentation process was developed in the 1970s, which helped to speed up the fermentation times. As I mentioned, this process has an aging effect on the taste of pu'er tea that is very similar to the effect on the taste of wine that you get from that fermentation process. Though for pu'er tea today, we are talking about that artificial process. How can they do this artificially? The farmers gather the tea leaves into a big pile, then cover it with a large sheet or tarp. They spray water on the tea every now and then, and therefore fermentation happens faster. 
Usually, the tea is left for 30, 45, 60, or even 90 days still. The farmer will check the tea every few days, and just by the feel of the tea, he knows whether it is ready or if it needs more time. Wow. That sounds like a fascinating process. I never realised that there was such a science behind producing tea. Well, now you are ready for the best part, the tasting of it. That sounds like a very good idea to me. So what I will do now is boil the water and we can begin our meditation. What does that entail? We need to focus on only two things. The first is your mind and body. Forget everything that you have been worrying about today. Forget about what you have to do later on, or what somebody said to you earlier. Focus on your breathing and on how your body feels. If you have aches and pains, acknowledge them. Pinpoint where there is tension in your body and try to release it. Oh yes, I can really feel tension in my shoulders. Let it go. Close your eyes if that helps. Take deep breaths in and out. Soon we will drink the tea. When you drink it, think about the taste and how it feels on your tongue. Is it easy to swallow the tea or do you need to gulp it? Can you brew the tea leaves more than once? Oh yes, you can brew some teas more than ten times. Now we will shift to noble silence, focusing only on ourselves and the tea. Enjoy. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecturer giving a talk about whale migration. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Today we're going to continue our investigation into the use of technology in plotting oceanographic migratory patterns. And I'd like to focus specifically on creatures that we didn't even realise existed until very recently. Pygmy blue whales. In particular, I'd like to talk about a high-tech method of tracking that researchers have used to find out more about these creatures. Pygmy blue whales, which are one of several subspecies of blue whales, spend their lives in the vast expanses of the Indian and Southern Pacific Oceans. They were first identified as a distinct subspecies in 1966. Before then, they were probably confused with the Antarctic or true blue whale, so it's only recently that researchers have started to learn about them and their migrations to and from their breeding and feeding grounds. Scientists are interested in pygmy blue whales because, although they are a very mobile subspecies, very little is known about their movements and their populations. Large-scale movements of whales 
are particularly hard to study. And what we do know about pygmy blue whales, we've mainly learned from examining whaling records. There are several populations of pygmy blue whales in the southern hemisphere and two main feeding grounds off southern and western Australia. Scientists were interested in testing their hypothesis that the pygmy blue whales feeding off Western Australia migrate to Indonesia to breed. To track the whales' movements, researchers made use of something called satellite telemetry. This refers to the use of a satellite-linked tag attached to a whale. When the antenna on the whale breaks the surface of the water, the tag communicates with a satellite system. The location of the whale can be determined when multiple satellites receive the tag's transmissions, much like how the navigation system works on a mobile phone. Researchers receive this location data in almost real time via the project website, which allows them to track the movement of the tagged whale from many miles away. The use of these tags has enabled researchers to discover that pygmy blue whales do indeed travel northwards from the west coast of Australia in March and April, reaching the warmer breeding grounds of Indonesia in June. They remain there until September, at which time they then return to Australian waters. In addition to identifying the migratory pattern of this particular population of pygmy whales, researchers also shone new light on the whales' feeding patterns. It's usually assumed that whales go without food outside of the summer when they leave their feeding grounds. But interestingly, the pygmy blue whales studied travel from productive feeding grounds off Western Australia to productive areas in Indonesia, and therefore probably still have the opportunity to feed whilst they're in their breeding grounds. It is hoped that mapping the migratory movements of the pygmy whales will help conservation efforts for these endangered animals. And the study has enabled researchers to identify specific conservation issues. For example, the migratory routes of pygmy blue whales correspond closely with shipping routes. Consequently, researchers are keen to monitor whether this has any negative effects on the whale's behaviour. Baleen whales, these are whales that use filters to feed, not teeth, use sounds to communicate and to gain information about their environment. Clearly, as pygmy blue whale movements correspond to shipping routes, there is potential for the noise generated by ships to affect communication and hence social encounters and feeding. Previously, researchers could only hypothesise that pygmy blue whales occupying Western Australian waters travelled into Indonesian waters. Now that this hypothesis has been borne out by evidence, conservation efforts can be undertaken in a wider area than just Australian waters. However, scientists aren't stopping here. A question mark still remains over the movements of the pygmy blue whales that utilise the feeding grounds further south, off the southern coast of Australia. Genetic evidence indicates that there is a mixing taking place between the population of whales in the feeding grounds of Western Australia and the population further south. Researchers are keen to discover whether the pygmy whales from the southern feeding grounds follow a similar migration route to those from the west coast, or whether they migrate to the subtropical region to the south of Australia. As a result, there are plans to tag the pygmy blue whales further south in order to find out whether they move through the same areas as the western population and are therefore exposed to the same risks. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.